Hi there. Uh, so my name is Przemysław Noga and I'm working for uh, Silly Auto, uh, the company that specializes in uh, providing the digital cockpits for the next uh, generation cars. And usually we are working with uh, systems that can handle multiple screens on one SOC. Uh, so this is opposite of uh, what uh, Simon was talking about. But today I will also focus on those low-end devices, so those MCUs that you can see at uh, our demo booth and also at the uh, Qt demo booth. Uh, we have prepared some nice demos for you. Uh, and of course, uh, I encourage you to come over and ask more questions on that topic. And um, yeah, so uh, I will be talking about the high-end UIs, so this uh, smartphone-like experience that Simon was mentioning uh, for those low-end devices. So let's uh, proceed. Uh, so we need to first understand what are those high-end UIs. So the uh, user expectations evolve. Uh, so just a few years back in time, this kind of thermostat was uh, just enough. Um, it was cool. You could change your temperature. You could uh, turn the heating on and off. That was enough. But we are living in the 21st century, so everyone expects that the thermostat will look like uh, rather like this one. Uh, so you could touch it. You can interact with it. It is colorful. It has uh, 60 FPS. It never has uh, any glitches. And that's what's the user expectation. So my children even trying to tap the, uh, our TV set uh, because they don't understand that it cannot be touched. So, um, so that's the case. Users want uh, nice and smooth uh, user interfaces uh, that will bring them the best possible experience that will be intuitive. Uh, and at the same time, it will be similar to the smartphone they have. So uh, nice animations, uh, really uh, colorful, and uh, all the stuff like that. So what are the uh, low-end devices? So we have uh, the uh, definition from uh, Wikipedia. Um, which I won't bring here because um, for myself, the uh, definition of the MCU or the microcontroller is becoming quite foggy as, um, for example, uh, two weeks ago, NXP announced their MCU will have one gigahertz clock and will also offer the two DGPU. So that brings us closer to the SOC. But on the other hand, we will still have the chip price and we will have power efficiency. So. Um, you could think of uh, the uh, low-end devices as the devices that have uh, low power consumption, are cheap, and um, are easily available. And um, the clock frequency is really different. So on the Qt booth, you can see a smartwatch demo that runs on the 120 megahertz uh, CPU clock. Um, the other boards have 200 megahertz, while the NXP 1050 has uh, 600 megahertz. So this is quite powerful. So you cannot uh, distinguish by the, by just by the CPU clock, but rather about the price factor, uh, attached peripherals, and, uh, and uh, the power efficiency and stuff like that. So um, this is how the, the border between the SOCs and MCUs are getting more and more foggy. Um, so let's repeat once again what Zimon was talking about. Uh, so let's try to summarize what is this uh, Qt for MCU. Uh, so mainly, Qt for MCU provides the independent implementation of Qt Quick uh, that brings you the subset of best QML and Qt Quick APIs. So you have all those uh, basic uh, items like rectangles, mouse areas, text fields. Um, you have, um, of course, also um, the animations, transition states, and stuff like that. Um, and also you have uh, some basic set of Qt, Qt Quick controls like uh, button, switch, uh, dial, progress bar, whatever else you think of. Um, so you are having those building blocks. Um, you also have some subset of uh, TypeScript, not maybe JavaScript exactly, but uh, you are able to implement your business logic uh, within your QML application. And uh, like we learned from Xenon, it will be compiled to the native code, converted to the native code, so it will be fast and efficient. And uh, of course, you have this uh, view model delegate paradigm there, so we can use, uh, steal it, uh, also, some views like list view uh, are already provided with uh, Qt for MCU. Uh, what's more, we have this Bermeta integration for now, and it will follow with uh, the RTOS uh, integrations. Uh, we have this interrupt event-driven loop that allows us to save the uh, energy. Um, we have uh, some use of graphics accelerators that that are different on diff on on, a, on every board. It can behave differently. So for example, if you will look for the automotive demo done also on the MCU, uh, on the RH850 uh, from Renaissance, uh, it has uh, 2D GPU integrated, so we can do wide scale of uh, 
matrix transformations, including uh, bilinear scaling uh, or rotation. So that works fine. And of course, uh, making an UI, because uh, what could for MCU is, is just a way for you to create the uh, UI, but you also need some business logic. So you won't implement uh, thermostat just by creating the QML files, right? So you need to send some signals to the GPIO or get some signals from the GPIO or SPIO, whatever else uh, interface there will be. Um, and that's the place where uh, Qt for MCU provides you some um, really simplistic uh, C++ uh, binding, binding side API uh, for data models, uh, for uh, proxy objects, and for uh, injecting, injecting your own events into the uh, event loop. Um, we'll take a closer look at, on that uh, in a while. So uh, what this presentation won't be about, so it won't be about uh, how smooth uh, everything can run on the uh, RH850. It won't be about how to build the uh, thermostat. You can uh, find out that yourself. And it, because Sony announced the PS5, it won't be also about my idea to revolutionize the gaming industry, become wealthy and rich. So that's off the table right now. Um, instead, uh, we will be talking about how you can start as the developers your adventure with uh, Qt for MCU and how easy it is actually. So now I have a question to you. Uh, please raise your hand if you know what is QML, you have been using QML, anyone? Yeah, a lot of people. Um, so it seems that I could leave the stage right now because you already know how to develop for the MCUs. So it's really so easy, so straightforward, but as I, I have still 25 more slides, I will keep you here. So I know that you are already thinking about the launch. Sorry for that. Um, yeah, so let's start with um, where Zimon left us, some Hello World uh, uh, example. I don't know why, why this Hello World is so popular, but I uh, haven't seen any course starting from something else, so I'm also doing that. Um, so yesterday, Lars mentioned that with Qt6, uh, everything will be done with CMake. So also kind of a playground for that was done for the Qt for MCU. Uh, so this is how your uh, project file will look like. Some really minimalistic uh, setup. Uh, you need to ensure that uh, the minimal version for this evaluation of package of uh, Qt for MCU uh, is uh, CMake uh, 313. You need to find a package that is provided by the Qt for MCU, which is called uh, Q QL, QL, whatever. Um, you need to, um, of course, uh, create your executable project. Then uh, there's an important thing. You need to uh, link against the uh, kill, kill, kill quick ultralight uh, library. And finally, there is a new macro that you need to uh, use in order to add any QML files. You can add as many as you wish, uh, as many as you have in your application. In this example, we will just use a single file. So it's called kill, kill target QML uh, sources. Um, okay, so let's take a look on our, um, on our QML file, this uh, Hello World QML. Uh, so it starts with Pragma main. We already know that this Pragma main will result in actually generating the uh, startup code for our application. Um, and uh, the only thing you need to remember is that you can place uh, that Pragma only in one file. Otherwise, you will get uh, the uh, compiler error because uh, the uh, QML to CPP compiler won't be able to define where is your entry point to the application? So just keep it one. Then you need to, of course, import uh, Qt Quick. Uh, this is uh, something that Lars mentioned yesterday, that there won't be any more versioning of those uh, Qt Quick modules. So you can skip, you can write uh, some version. It will be simply ignored. If you would like to have your code um, also um, portable to the uh, desktop Qt, probably it's best to actually add the version number. But if you want, um, yeah, this is how the uh, Qt for MC works. And we have some um, translations, how those works internally was shown by Zimun. Of course, like I said, you have all those, um, all those uh, QML and quick goodies like um, relation, relative uh, positioning uh, via anchors. You can do, use those uh, easily. And they are in place, they're just waiting to be used. Okay. and. Um, the only problem uh, is that it will be rendered with some default font that is supplied with, uh, with Qt for MCU package, which is a deja vu font, and probably 
you would look you would like to use something more fancy. So there's no problem with that. So let's return to our CMake file. And uh, by defining one uh, CMake variable pointing to the directory where you store your phones, uh, you can tell the uh, mm, QML font compiler tool where to look for the fonts you are asking for. So if uh, assuming that in my source tree of my project, I have this uh, font subdirectory where I have the Roboto font, uh, then I, would, uh, I could easily ask uh, text element to use uh, the Roboto as the font family, and it will be rendered with uh, proper glyphs. Only those glyphs uh, that were used for uh, the text you have used or for any translation variation will be embedded with the uh, text element. So, uh, so it allows you to save some uh, memory in the flash or, yeah, in the flash and also in the RAM. So we can use the uh, family uh, Roboto for the font. Uh, okay, so, but if you, I wouldn't like to repeat this uh, Roboto in every case because this will be only uh, one font I will be using, then I can use another CMake variable uh, called uh, QL default font family. I can just specify uh, the default font family and it will be uh, used everywhere when I, where I won't specify the font family exactly. Um, okay, Zimon already uh, showed you a code uh, that can be problematic. Uh, that uh, when, uh, when you are dealing with string color, string representation of color, uh, then it uh, needs to be solved at the compile time. So everything is fine as long as you are storing that to the property of type color. Uh, you are safe then to use um, this uh, hexadecimal notation or, um, or uh, SVG color name or even um, hexadecimal with alpha channel. So it's okay to use that. But once you will... Um, try to do something like this. So exactly the same uh, example as uh, shown by Zimon. You would like to change the color of the text uh, when mouse area is pressed. Then you will get a compiler warning. Thankfully, this compiler warning is quite meaningful. Um, so you know already that you cannot use the string colors. And uh, you can use the um, helper function um, that is um, actually kind of identity function that simply um, or maybe it's not identity function, but it simply converts uh, at the compile time or tell the compiler to treat this uh, particular string as the color representation. If uh, you will try to type something that cannot com be converted to um, color into this uh, function, then you will get another error that uh, this is not a color. So um, error handling is one of the things that uh, Qt for MCU does pretty well. Um, yeah, and. Uh, Similar situation is with the uh, image assets. Uh, so as we already know, those are, those are embedded as the raw data into our binary. And, um, and because of that, um, compiler needs to know the path. Uh, there is no concept of URLs uh, in the uh, Qt for MCU. So um, for the simple case we, where we are assigning directly to the, um, to the uh, source uh, image, which is of type image, uh, then it's okay, compiler can find out that. But uh, if we will try to do once again a different image whenever the mouse area is pressed, uh, then we will get the uh, compilation error stating that, sorry, I don't know how to convert string to image. And that's a hint for us that we should use another helper function, or actually helper compiler function, uh, that uh, we, we shall use this image to tell that this is URL to actual asset. So um, you shall use that uh, in the, um, in the uh, scripting expressions, but also uh, in uh, list models. So those are also supported. And uh, the same for the colors. So whenever you try to use it somewhere bes beside assigning that directly to the property of a uh, given type, then please surround that with uh, image or color. Um, actually, I think that those are two only different functions uh, that, uh, that uh, work uh, differently than in um, mainline Qt or mainline QML. Uh, there's one uh, issue with list model uh, that uh, compared to the, uh, to the uh, mainline Qt, uh, the list models are immutable um, and uh, simply you cannot uh, change them at the uh, runtime. Because uh, once again, some C++ code is generated out of that uh, in the compile time. So you should rather think of uh, list models as uh, helpers for uh, you to design something and uh, just to mock up the data. 
mock-up for your view. Uh, and you shouldn't uh, actually use them on the production. There are some C++ APIs uh, that you could uh, simply uh, implement uh, to, uh, to follow this uh, and uh, to provide the actual data for your views. Um, okay, we already know that uh, in future releases of Qt, Qt6, uh, the uh, scripting expression will require uh, strong typing. Uh, same for the parameters, arguments, or for the return, return value. So you need to uh, use those because we are compiling the code to the C++. So we, we need to know, uh, or the compiler needs to know um, how or with which type it deals. So otherwise it will be some nasty uh, templates error and uh, you would like to avoid seeing those. Um, and uh, with this syntax, uh, it's also possible to use uh, in Qt 5.14. Simply Qt 5.14 ignores any, any information about the uh, uh, strong typing. Uh, so this makes the code uh, more compatible between the uh, full Qt and uh, Qt for uh, MCU. Um, yeah, maybe let's return to this function. So once again, here you can see that I'm referring to the uh, QL.color function because from the scripting expression level, uh, otherwise it will be just a string and I would get error that I'm trying to return string in place of color. Um, yeah, so one of the features that I'm missing most, and it's not ready yet, and I hope that it will be a part of uh, 1.0, uh, is that you cannot do something like this. So we have a repeater uh, of uh, four, four uh, elements uh, with some text item that shall show the item number and index of the item. So it won't compile. Simply, there is no string concatenation at the uh, runtime from the QML level. Of course, you can expose string properties from your C++ code. Uh, so how to work around that? Uh, you could simply use some layout container, like row in this case, and you could place the um, two text elements next to each other, one with the normal text, and the second one with the integer value. Uh, for the um, numeric values, uh, there was a question on the previous session. For the numeric values, um, by default, when the glyphs are generated, uh, it generates all the uh, numbers from 0 to 9 and uh, dot symbol. Uh, so if you are going to combine your strings with uh, numbers or just displaying the numbers, uh, you don't need to uh, explicitly declare the, uh, the glyphs, um, the glyphs um, uh, set that should be used. So that's also a nice thing. Um, yeah, I said at the beginning that you can uh, also use uh, some or uh, some cute quick controls are provided, and in order to use those, um, there is another library that you need to link to. So this is called Quick Ultralight Control Style Default. Really a strange name uh, for something that just provides you the default styling for uh, for the quick controls. Of course, uh, you can um, style your control or style the controls yourself. There's a different uh, library you need to link to. Um, that can be found in, the, or the description how to do that can be found uh, in the documentation provided with the uh, Qt for MCU evaluation package. Uh, so um, it's rather a straightforward process. So it's those, those styling those controls is exactly like, like styling with uh, uh, Qt Quick controls too. Uh, of course, you need to uh, link against some library. You need to uh, add something to CMake, but that's all. Um, so how to use the quick controls? Once again, we're doing import. Once again, we don't need to give the version number. We can, but it will be simply ignored. So we could type 411 there, and nobody will uh, ask about why you are asking about version that wasn't released yet. Um, and then you can have some, uh, for example, button elements. Of course, you can react on the uh, signals out of those, this control. You can. One, one way of debugging, uh, if you are not using JTAG or any GDB server connection, uh, one way is, of course, uh, tracing the information. So you can do that easily with uh, console log that is available also in Qt for MCU. So we will see the output on the, uh, on the console attached to the device. And uh, we're getting uh, to the C++ code integration. So I've mentioned that there are some basic uh, C++ binding APIs or proxy APIs. And uh, so let's uh, think about how to use those. I won't go much to the details. Uh, also, please refer to the uh, evaluation package documentation as it's nicely describes everything. 
Uh, I will just show uh, some basic examples, and I encourage you to dive uh, deeper. Uh, so forget about the uh, QML register type, QML register singleton type, about pushing anything to the uh, Qt quick context. Those are things that are happening in the runtime. So, and as we already know, with Qt for MCU, everything is compiled ahead of time. Uh, so there's n those are meaningless in the Qt for MCU world. Um, and what we have instead, so say hello to uh, another CMake macro, QL target generate interfaces. Uh, so this macro is really simple to use, uh, and you should use it for every um, C++ type that you would like to expose to QML. So it makes the, this type available uh, from the QML level. Uh, so uh, we have this QL target generate interfaces. We, of course, give the target, and then we give the header to our, our class implementation. So then it's passed, and the uh, intermediate QML imp implementation is uh, generated out of that. And uh, assuming that this is our code, what's important, you shall, uh, for example, in this case, uh, derived for, uh, for, from the QL object class, uh, which will create the proxy object that you can use from or instantiate from QML. Um, it can, of course, have some signals. It can, of course, have some property. The property can be a in value, that in values will be also available directly to the QML. Um, of course, you can also, in, there are no slots, or these slots are rather in the private, private API uh, set for now, uh, but uh, you can um, invoke any public method from your class. So all the public methods will be av available to call from the uh, QML. So how, how this uh, will look like from the QML code level? So we are instantiating our awesome code class, and this will create uh, another instance. Uh, of course, we can react on some uh, signals that will be emitted out of it. We can bind to it properties, and we can access the uh, enum values that were defined there. Um, once again, we can use the translations, for example, in, that, in such case. And um, we can invoke the public method that was defined there. Um, if you would like to have a singleton class, so this scenario with QML register singleton type, uh, then you will simply uh, derive from a different class, which is uh, QL singleton, which is uh, implemented by uh, the CRTP pattern, and beside that, nothing changes. So the rest of the implementation is the same, the only different base member, and of course you will uh, use that differently from the uh, QML level, as you cannot uh, instantiate the object anymore, uh, then rest of the code remains uh, pretty same beside the fact that you need to use the class name to access properties or, uh, or enum values uh, or invoke the method. Uh, of course, uh, the, to, to connect to the signals, you need to use the connections element, which is also supported. So as we already seen, a wide of uh, QML mechanism are in place. Uh, so if you, are no, if you know QML, if you uh, were listening to what, what I'm talking, so you can get out of this room and directly start developing for the MCUs. Um, getting close to the end, uh, some performance and uh, size hints on how we can improve the performance and size. First performance hint is always test that on the target device. So we have this, um, we have this uh, desktop backend that you can use that was presented by Zimon. It was uh, really nice but you will never know what's the uh, overall performance of the target device uh, and how it behaves. So it will render smoothly on the desktop, but once deployed to the board, it might behave differently. Um, use static text element. Uh, so although it will increase the uh, size of the binary uh, because it will embed uh, the whole sentence or paragraph as the pre-rendered glyphs, uh, instead of just storing the individual glyphs that you can build the string of, so first of all, in runtime, you won't have to, uh, you won't have to um, lay out the text. And second of all, you will have only one blending operation instead of a blending operation for each glyph separately. Um, use colorized image. Uh, so uh, as uh, you shall know already, you can store the images as the alpha maps, and then you can overlay some color on that. So if you have a single color image, then it's wise to uh, store it as an alpha map because this way you will save some, uh, you will save some space on, uh, uh, on, on the device. 
Um, consider using the RGB565 color scheme. It will maybe look a bit uh, uglier, but uh, then you don't need so much RAM for the uh, frame buffers. Uh, you don't need so much RAM for your opaque uh, assets, and that's good. Avoid scaling, avoid uh, rotating. On most of the boards, there are no uh, hardware acceleration for those operations, so those needs to be done by CPU. And avoid redrawing whole screen. And uh, that's the case uh, where uh, you might be not even aware that you are trying to do that. So let's uh, take a look on this uh, example. Uh, so if you will use the uh, fade in, fade out transition between the screens, we need to draw every item on the screen. So every item, item from the bottom layer and from the top layer. And uh, this will mean that probably we will, won't get the 60 FPS, we will be dropped to 57, and later on probably to 30, as there is a switch on the render loop that tracks how, how long it takes uh, to render frame and tries to optimize the CPU time to not try to render too much. So if you are not able to fit into 60 FPS, then at some after some time, you will be cut off to just uh, 30 FPS. And instead, you could just use the uh, slide in, slide out, because uh, the opaque regions or the items under the opaque regions are not being rendered, as we already know from Xemon Tux. Uh, so that's uh, cool stuff. And um, last, last but not least, um, Qt is uh, like pointed by yesterday by Lars. Uh, Qt is uh, famous from its community. So I encourage you to request the evaluation license to try it yourself. The development boards are really cheap, so it's uh, 60, 80 bucks maybe, and you can start your adventure uh, with the evaluation version. And if you will do something nice, and I believe that you will do, then please uh, share it in social media, use the uh, tag, for example, built with Qt for MCU. And um, yeah, and uh, we will see how it evolves. So waiting for the version 1.0. So yeah, thank you. Any questions? Everything, everyone is thinking about lunch, right? <laughs> yeah, so let's eat something, and you can always find me next to the silly booth. Uh, will the code written for the MCU also compile on the desktop, or what will happen with all of this? Uh, uh, yeah, so actually, uh, there is a single C++ code that gets generated. Uh, so you can uh, compile that for desktop or for MCU, that doesn't matter, because the framework code is the same. The difference is on the uh, platform adaptation. So uh, there's a different entry point, different uh, frame buffer, and so on. There is another quite common framework uh, for accessing hardware on microcontrollers, the Arduino. Yeah. Um, are there any plans to interact with uh, it? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that's a good question to a Qt company. Uh, I don't know. Maybe would be nice. Although it's a really, really low end, so it might have some problems with uh, getting the target frame rate. Okay. Thank you okay, very much. So thank and you, and uh, see you on our booth. Ah, oh, one more question, right? What will be the license? It will be commercially available. And the second question, uh, what you have said uh, today, is it in the documentation available somewhere? Um, yeah, the documentation is provided with the um, evaluation package. So I don't know nothing. I, I, I know nothing about the pricing model or the distribution model later on. Still, this is uh, alpha release. Uh, so uh, many things may change on the, for example, CMake API level. Uh, but you should uh, get in touch with uh, Qt professional services or Qt, uh, just ask Qt for evaluation. There's a form on the website, and probably they, they will return to you with uh, some pricing offer. Okay, then thank you very much. Thank you. And have a nice lunch. Stop. Sessions. <laughs>